家落座一下吧。我们开始今天下午的第二个 talk， 需要 Pinterest 的人来给大家分享一下他们那边的这个应用。哦、oh, ，对，呃，呃，就是呃，因为他们都从美国回来，然后准备的也是英文，所以他们会用英文来讲这个 talk。OK，OK、okay. okay.。所以那我就用英文讲了，因为我们准备的就是英文版的，不好意思。呃、uh, ，So， 呃、uh, ，Hi everyone， like my name is Chen Ji， and、uh, this is 梁红。So we are from Pinterest Store Caching team, and uh, today we're going to present our work in the past year, which is mainly focused on uh, multi-sale and efficient uh, backup for HBase. Uh, so first, I'm going to go through like the HBase in Pinterest, uh, the current situation, and uh, then I'm going to talk about the multi-sale. Um, sale here is like uh, since Pinterest use uh, AWS. Uh, you can think of Sarah as a um, region or data center. Um, then Liang Hong will talk about uh, the efficiency uh, backup work. Um, so first, uh, the edge base in Pinterest. Um, so we start to use edge base for online service since uh, 2013. And uh, uh, for online cases, uh, it's used to backup like storage uh, abstraction layer like Zen and UMS. Um, then you can think about something like Facebook's Tau, or I think the Genesis Graph, uh, which deal with graph-based data. And the UMS is like just abstraction for a simple key value uh, data service, which is basically data without any index. Um, for offline, we use edge base for like uh, analytics and also long-term metrics. Um, so currently we have around like 50 edge base uh, 1.2 clusters. Uh, our internal build is based on 1.2, and but it also supports more features like uh, CSTD and CSS map, um, off heap bucket cache, and also we change like the HBase protocol to support like the we call annotations and uh, also the return the timestamp for the any write operation. Um, so next is uh, multi sale. Uh, why multi-sale? Because uh, um, in the past few years, Pinterest started to invest in uh, internationalization. So uh, we have more than 200 million active users, and more than half of are from out of states. Um, so we have more than 50% are uh, international users. So to provide a more reliable and lower latency uh, service, we decided to explore like the multi-sale solution for our uh, infrastructure. Um, so here's the basic architecture for our uh, multi-sale environment. Uh, so we have a global uh, load balancer, uh, which basically uh, follow the traffic based on uh, your location. So we follow the traffic to nearest the sale. Uh, for example, we have like US East and US West. Um, and uh, in each sale, like, we have like a very similar mirror stack, uh, which contains like the local load balancer and the front end service, back end service, data service, and database and cache. Um, so uh, the data service is something we mentioned about before. It like uh, some service graph service like then, and uh, which will call a database and cache to read or write data. Uh, and the source of truth database will replicate like the data between each other uh, to remote DB. So we only allow uh, cross sale traffic uh, on data service and the database layer. Uh, so we, we actually provide two uh, patterns of uh, consistent level uh, based on table. So you can mark your case as must must or, or must slave. Uh, first is must must. Uh, I think in some other term we call it alive alive, uh, which means like both sales can take the right traffic. And uh, you can see from the graph like if uh, that's um, so if like the right the request will be just write local database and the, the other bi-direction replication to sync up the data for, to each other. Uh, this is actually pretty common for like a simple key value database and uh, has actually cover most of our case. Um, this is applied to cases like they, they don't require a strong uh, consistency and uh, the data is less likely to have conflicts. And another pattern is called a must slave. Um, 
So for example, um, this is most of the cases for like uh, compete for primary key. Um, so like you sign up for email and the username and it has to be uh, unique globally. So uh, we have to provide the must slave. So for example, if here the West uh, is the master, so if a write request is forward to the US East, um, it will forward, the data service will actually forward like the whole request to the uh, West data service. And it updated to the West database and the database will have one way uh, direction, uh, replicate direction to the East database. And uh, here we have uh, another concept called uh, uh, remote marker here. Uh, we actually, well, the east side data service will set a remote marker, which means like the local database data is out of date. So, um, so next time, uh, and as long as like actually uh, the replication the arrived, uh, this remote marker will be cleaned. So the remote marker is used on the read side. So if like a read comes and uh, we we'll first check the remote marker, if the other uh, exists here, it means that the local database is out of date. So we have to forward the request to the remote data service to read the data. Uh, originally, we depends on TTL to expire the remote marker. And later we find like uh, it's very hard to train a static TTL to a perfect number. So um, the longer will cause more traffic cross traffic and the shorter will cause inconsistency. So we decide to uh, introduce another service to uh, clean the remote marker. Uh, so basically um, it's called a caching value service. Uh, like we have to, um, so this is also deal with another consistent issue is basically uh, in the single cell, the, ca the consistency between cache and the database. So no matter which pattern you follow, uh, there's always a case like, uh, so let's say the write happened on the east side, right? But uh, the west has no way aware of this request happen. So um, if there are some data in the cache related to the uh, data, that cache will uh, be out of date because we have, we deal with all the logic in the data service. So um, like in the, um, in the like the, the corner left, uh, down, uh, lower corner, we have like the, this kind of systems. Like we ask a database to publish the right to Kafka consumer, and the caching invitation will works out the Kafka consumer, and based on the, uh, the data in the Kafka event and some mapping custom mapping logic to uh, infer like the cache key to invalidate the cache data, and uh, the same logic will apply to the remote marker to for clean. Um, so previous we we'll talk about the, the totally like our multi cell architecture in general, and but did not touch how we embed it with like uh, edge base. Um, so I'm going to talk about how to embed it with MySQL and edge base, um, which are the two major databases used in Pinterest. So actually, uh, when we design this whole architecture, uh, this is basically based on MySQL, because. Uh, this is uh, Facebook already explored the same solution and uh, running production for a while. And there's a lot of open source project you can use. So it is very easy for us to adapt to MySQL. Uh, we can use some open source project like Maxwell and uh, uh, MySQL comment. Um, so in the that side, um, you have to, um, the database have to publish the changes to Kafka event. Um, so Maxwell is actually an open source project which can uh, tell the Bing log in MySQL and publish the uh, changes to the Kafka. And uh, MySQL comment is a feature that allow you can insert some customized uh, com in the, like, the SQL. So it will eventually be in the Bing log but like they have, it will not be parsed. You can add some customized logic for your uh, use case. So to implement the same thing, um, we actually develop a corresponding solutions as Maxwell and Comment for MySQL. So uh, one thing like the, we call the edge-based replication proxy, which is corresponding to the Maxwell, and we call edge-based annotations, which corresponding to MySQL comment. Um, so here is the edge-based replication proxy. Um, so this is actually works as a uh, fake edge based clusters. But instead of writing the data to the wall log on MemStore, uh, it will actually publish the 
replication request to the Kafka. So the proxy actually exposes the edge-based replicate API, and uh, multiple edge-based class can share the same proxy as long as we set up the replication peer. So if we, we just want to build a, you want to publish uh, the data to a Kafka, uh, you just it is the same as just add a replication peer uh, in the edge base. And uh, yeah, so um, it is uh, uh, allow customized Kafka topic and. Uh, uh, each actual cafe event will corresponding to a mutation in the edge base. Uh, yeah. So we also actually change the edge base protocol to support edge base annotations, which like actually uh, in the in a mutated request you can add some customized uh, comment inside it. Uh, this will be part of the mutated request and uh, will be be in the wall log, but not will be uh, stored in the database. Um, so here's one of the actually the edge based Kafka event example. So you can see the uh, row key table operation and the delta is actually the, the diff. The ZA equal equal is actually the column family. Um, this is the common edge based uh, mutated mutated request. But here's the type and the full request ID is actually part of the annotation. So the annotation is actually works as a map. So you can actually add a key and value customized information to it. Um, so besides the multi cell we also use that for our asynchronous index. Um, so since actually edge base itself does not support a transaction or a secondary index, um, so we have so we we always do double write, which is like insert uh, the entity index separately. Uh, but it's will cause inconsistency, like if one of the write requests fails. So uh, we actually use this whole system, just like you uh, send, uh, publish the event uh, changes to Kafka, and uh, the other service is called Async Index to consume it, and then insert index to back to the edge base cluster. Uh, so in that case, we can guarantee eventual consistency, and uh, um, but there will be a delay. Um, there will a small gap like the entity and uh, the index is actually separate, uh, is like not consistency. But this is actually uh, in practice like most of our clients are okay with this small gap. Um, they more care about like, the consistency, uh, eventual consistency. Uh, this is currently used for our uh, Zen, uh, which is a graph database and also our ad system. Uh, another thing we did is like we asked the uh, edge base to return the timestamp for the right request. Uh, so to avoid the risk condition, so basically if you write too heavy, the same key, um, you, you need a timestamp to de decide the which data is later and update with the cache. Um, so the last issue we met in the actual multi cell is the replication topology. Um, so we sometimes need to do operation on one of the edge based cluster. Um, so we have to do the failover. Um, like, so we, the originally we have this kind of like a circle replication flow. And, uh, but this has the issue is like, uh, if like each side the other, the slave is down, uh, you basically cannot do uh, any single cell fail. You have to do a global fail, which is very expensive. So to make this tolerant with um, two cluster loss, uh, you have, we have to set like force choose two, which is six replicating links. Uh, this is extremely heavy and uh, I think each data will like replicate three times. So we actually uh, expose the idea, basically we use a zookeeper proxy. Um, so it will just, uh, each side, uh, the master will just talk to the, uh, 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 remote the cube proxy to get the remote master's uh, list. And the, each side, the, uh, the, with the failover, the edge base will uh, update the zookeeper with the region server list. Yeah, um, yeah we, but we, this solution is still in testing, so we may have more results in the future. Um, so next, Liang Hong, we are going to talk about how we improve our uh, edge base backup process uh, in Pinterest. Hi everyone, my name is Liang Hong um, and uh, thanks CJ for 
uh, presenting the work in Multicell. Um, Multicell makes Pinterest infrastructure uh, tolerate failures from an entire cell. Um, in addition to that, at Pinterest, uh, we use edge-based backup to enhance the availability of our uh, cluster because it serves critical data. Um, so in the next part, I'm gonna switch gear and uh, talk about how we do efficient backup. Um, so while backup is uh, probably a common practice in industry, um, in this talk, I will present how, we, uh, how our backup pipeline evolves over time and how we, um, how we were able to dramatically uh, improve the backup efficiency. All right. So, um, so as CJ mentioned before, uh, Edgebase is used for both our online and offline uh, services and it serves uh, highly critical data. Uh, we have tens of clusters containing um, tens of petabytes of data and most of this data needs to be backed up uh, to S3 uh, on a daily basis. Um, so, um, so we do a combination of full and incremental backup. So uh, to be more specific, um, we do a combination of snapshot plus uh, right ahead log, uh, also known as wall. Um, so the snapshot is, uh, you, can, um, you can interpret that as a full backup. Basically you um, backup all the data in the, um, all the edge files in an edge based cluster and upload it onto S3. Um, we do it on a daily basis. And for wall log, we do it on a much more frequent basis so that we can do point in time recovery. So for example, in our production clusters, we usually do uh, like two or five minutes based on the right traffic. So uh, for garbage collection uh, issues, uh, we, we obviously don't keep all the data in S3, so we will have some uh, retention policy uh, to discard old data. So what we do is we do um, weekly and monthly backups according to some uh, preset retention policy. Um, so this backup data is important because it's not, only, um, uh, it's not only for disaster recovery, but it's also used by um, a lot of our offline jobs to uh, analyze the edge-based dumps so that they can look into the data, do more analysis, uh, using Hive queries to uh, uh, like do offline jobs, things like this. Okay, um, so before I dive into, uh, before I dive into more, uh, uh, more details, I want to note that for historical reasons, Pinterest has been using edge-based, uh, had been using edge-based version uh, 0.94. Uh, which is quite old version, but it's always painful to do an upgrade. So until very recently, we did an upgrade to uh, 1.2, uh, but, but until then, we were using this very old version. So when we were first build, building the uh, backup pipeline, um, there was no existing tool to directly ex uh, export edge-based snapshot onto S3. So uh, this graph shows the uh, legacy uh, uh, backup pipeline that we were using before uh, a switch uh, before the edge base upgrade. So our original backup pipeline, as you can see on the graph on the right, uh, it consists of two steps. Um, in the first step, we export all the edge base data. So I'm, I'm more focused on the uh, snapshot one. Uh, for wall, is uh, approximately the same uh, process. So all the data is exported to a dedicated backup HDFS cluster. Uh, as shown in the uh, green box in the middle. And the second step, we will uh, upload the data in HDFS cluster uh, uh, onto S3. As you can probably tell, uh, this is not an ideal solution. And be uh, especially because um, as the amount of data um, on the order of petabytes grows over time, the storage cost on S3 um, and the backup cluster continues to increase. And it also involves a lot of uh, operational overhead for us. Since when the HDFS cluster is in trouble, our entire backup pipeline would be broken and we are in trouble. Like the offline uh, job uh, analyst will, uh, like, will come to us and complain. Um, so as I mentioned before, recently uh, we completed an edge base upgrade from version 94 to version 1.2. Uh, along with numerous bug fixes, and I know we are talking about HBase 3.0 now, but uh, we are using 1.2 and it's uh, now working uh, good enough for us. And 
uh, along with numerous bug fixes and uh, like performance improvements in this version, the new version of HBase uh, comes with the native support to directly export a uh, table to uh, S3. So taking this opportunity, uh, we optimize our backup pipeline by removing the HDFS cluster, which is the kind of uh, pain point in our backup pipeline. And we, uh, as you may notice in the right graph, we also created a tool called Pindedupe uh, that asynchronously deduplicated, uh, deduplicates the redundant snapshot files um, on S3 so that we can greatly reduce the S3 uh, storage capacity used. And we will talk about that later. Um, all right. Oops. Okay. All right. So um, this next, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, major challenge we encountered uh, in the migration. It seemed very simple, but when we were so, one of the major challenge we encountered in the migration is we want to minimize uh, its impact on production edge-based cluster because they serve online requests. Um, table export, uh, like. Like you can think about like the backup is exporting tables, right, to S3. It's done in a MapReduce job, uh, similar to DISTCP. To increase the upload uh, throughput, what we did is we used the um, S3A um, uh, fast upload option. And one, observer one observation uh, we have is that, um, so we have some internal experiments before we brought it online. We observed that direct S3 uh, upload tends to be highly CPU intensive. So often the time, uh, this is especially true for large edge fi uh, large files such as edge files. Like it can easily go beyond one gigabyte or even ten gigabytes. So this happens because a large file, uh, before it's uh, transferred onto S3, is going to be broken down into multiple chunks. Each of this chunk needs to be hashed and signed before it could be uh, uploaded. So if we use more stress than the number of uh, cores on the machine. The region server performing this upload will be saturated, and it could be uh, it could crash. So to mitigate to mit mitigate this problem, uh, what we did is we we carefully uh, constrain the maximum number of concurrent threads and the YARM containers uh, per host, so that the maximum CPU overhead that we were uh, we were able to achieve is uh, is under thirty percent. All right. So next, I'm going to um, talk about how we did the um, uh, deduplication, uh, how we do the deduplication work. So the idea of deduplicating edge-based snapshots is actually inspired by the observation that large edge files often remain the same, like w across backup cycles. So while incremental updates are there right, written to wall, and they, they are merged with minor compactions, right? Large edge files, uh, they account for most of the storage, but they, they, are, uh, they are only merged during a major compaction. So as a result, adjacent, uh, adjacent backup dates usually contain many duplicate files. So that is the key observation. So if you have uh, some backup files in day one and some backup files in day two, it's highly possible that, a lot, that the largest file is not going to change. And taking this opportunity, you can have a massive uh, saving in terms of S3 uh, storage. So, um, so, so the right graph shows a highly uh, shows a very basic exam example. Uh, on the left side is day one uh, backup file, and on the right side is day two backup file. So, um, I'm let's say these are the three files uh, within a single region. Um, so, in day one, uh, the uh, edge files have like F1, 2, 3. And in day two, uh, the F2 and F3, those two smaller files are compacted uh, using minor compaction. But the larger files will still remain the same, um, although the smaller files will, uh, will be changed. As a result, if we can identify this opportunity and deduplicate the uh, larger file uh, naming F1 here, um, we, can, we can get the saving. Um, so based on this observa uh, observation, uh, we built a simple tool called, um, called Pindedupe uh, because we are Pinterest. So uh, it's, it does, um, it does a, a very simple thing. Basically, it asynchronously checks for duplicate H S3 files 
and it replaced the older files uh, with references to the new ones on S3. So now you are not storing actual physical data, but you are storing a pointer. Um, okay, so this graph is just uh, giving a more uh, detailed uh, insight into how we, how PinGDB actually does it. It takes two inputs. Uh, the, the first input is the um, backup date, uh, the S3 uh, pass to the, uh, uh, to the previous backup. And the second parameter is the, uh, the S3 pass to the current backup pass. And what it does is it breaks these files, it groups these files uh, by regions. It only checks for duplicate files in regions, uh, assuming that files will not move around across regions, which is true uh, in most cases. So it traverses the uh, uh, directory hierarchy and determines for each region like which files are, dupli uh, are duplicate. And we only claim the files to be duplicate if the file name is the same, uh, the, uh, if the file names are the same and the file checksums match. Um, so, so this, so by grouping uh, files by regions instead of doing a global index, uh, we were able to avoid the need for large on on disk uh, index, and we can put all the indexes in memory. As a result, it's extremely fast. Yeah, I think we mentioned about that. So, um, so despite the simplicity of PinDedupe, uh, there were several key design choices that we had to consider. Uh, so we will mainly talk about three choices that we made here. So first is file versus chunk deduplication. Uh, the second is online versus offline deduplication. And the third is how we do file encoding. Um, so, so while like file deduplication has already provided us some very good uh, compression ratio. We were trying to uh, take a step further and to see how much better we can get if we use a more fine-grained deduplication uh, uh, approach, which is uh, chunk-based deduplication. So just to remind ourselves what a file deduplication and chunk deduplication, what's the difference is that in file dedupe, you basically, you take a checksum of the entire file and compare the checksum. In, uh, in chunk-based deduplication, what you do is you divide the chunk into a variable number of chunks. The chunk size can be fixed or can be a variable size. And you do a checksum of each of the chunk in the file and you index each of the uh, index, uh, chunks. So when the new chunk comes in, you can just compute the checksum and look up in the index. If it's in the index, you know this chunk has already appeared before and then you see this is duplicated file uh, chunk and can be deduplicated. So in theory, actually in many cases, um, chunk deduplication can provide much better uh, compression ratio than file dedupe. Uh, but surprisingly, it's not the case in edge-based deduplication. So we actually implemented a chunk level dedupe in pin dedupe. Uh, what we did is it computes uh, wrapping fingerprints uh, with the industry standard four kilobyte chunk size. Um, this actually increased a lot of the uh, implementation complexity, but we thought it was worth it. Um, however, it turned out that the, uh, the benefits is, is trivial. So basically, you don't get much more by using a uh, more fine-grained deduplication approach. And I will, I will explain why. So let's consider a typical scenario when we have, a, uh, when we have two files, when we are trying to do a um, major compaction. Before the compaction, we have a large file and we have a smaller file uh, noted in the uh, yellow box. And after com uh, compaction, as you can see, although the uh, smaller edge file to be merged is, is smaller in size, those smaller changed, when they are merged, they spread across all the entire, uh, all the, all, all the place. So you can see if we uh, do a chunk again, like mostly all the chunks are modified. So as a result, you can, you can, it's very hard for you to find a totally duplicate chunk in this case. Okay, so what's the lesson we learned? Um, lesson is that for edge-based backups and, um, and maybe, maybe for some other systems that are using this kind of the similar uh, compaction mechanisms, file level GDB is actually good enough. And we also try to uh, tune our major compaction schedule to be less uh, aggressive so that the largest file, uh, the, uh, the major compaction of the largest file only happen when necessary. 
Um, so, so, the next, so the next step is online versus offline dedupation. So what do they mean? Um, online dedupe is like, um, so online dedupe, the, uh, the, gra the graph on the left shows uh, the process of online dedupe. So basically it fetches file checksums from S3, uh, from S3 about the uh, checksums of the previous date. And before it tr transfers data into S3, it will do a comparison to see if this file exists before or not. And it will only transfer those files that are, it's never seen before. And it feels like this is the right approach to go because it could potentially uh, reduce the amount of data to be transferred. Uh, but we ended up choosing an offline uh, approach, uh, which is shown on the right side. So what does offline approach mean? Basically, we transfer blindly all, we blindly transfer all the files onto S3, and then we do the deduplication in an uh, offline asynchronous manner. manner. And the doing, so, um, doing so has several advantages. Some of the key advantages is that it allows us to control when the deduplication happens. So basically, some of our downstream jobs don't expect their files to be deduplicated. Um, and, and when we could delay the deduplication until those analysis jobs are done, uh, this is great for them. And doing so also separate the backup and dedupe pipeline so that dedupe fail won't uh, cause backup job to fail. Um, all right. So, so the last design choices is about file encoding. Um, so basically, think about it. If we ha have identified two identical files on S3, so how should we encode it? So we should, we should replace one of them with a pointer, but which one? The new one or the, uh, or the old one? So that's the question we are trying to answer here. So the intuitive, uh, the intuitive uh, like approach seems to be uh, keep the old file the same and deduplicate the new one, right? So you don't touch the old data, and when you only when adding new data, you change it to deduplicated form. So uh, this graph shows how, uh, how this is done. We have, uh, let's say F1 is the first day of backup data, F2 and F3 uh, are this, uh, uh, next, for the next days. And this is what we call backward dedupe chain. Now, when F, F2 is added in, um, in S3, although it's the same, we keep F1 uh, untouched and replace F2 with a pointer to F1. And the same thing for S3 is we uh, replace the um, S3's content with a pointer to F1. And the nice, nice properties about this approach is that uh, when you do decoding, there's only one step. So basically, when you are trying to reference S3, uh, you only need to uh, decode the reference, uh, dereference the pointer one time, and you can get the original file content. Uh, but the disadvantage of this approach is that it causes some dangling file pointers. Uh, as you are all familiar with pointer, when you delete something, uh, especially when we have retention policy, when we delete the older file like F1 here, then S F2 and F3 uh, becomes uh, unaccessible. So uh, our design choices was to use, uh, you, to keep the latest, latest file unchanged. And the rationale behind this is that um, there's no overhead accessing the latest copy. So basically, uh, we always keep the latest backup file up to date, uh, untouched. There's no uh, decoding overhead. Um, and it also avoids dangling pointer problem because uh, when you are deleting older files, you are actually just deleting the pointers and the actual file is still there. Uh, of course, there's a trade-off that we're making here. Now, if, we, uh, if you somehow want to recover F1, you will have to dereference twice. And if, if the chain is longer, you need to go back further. But that is very, very uh, infrequent case. If at least we haven't seen that in practice yet. Um, okay, um, so, so this slide shows some of the initial, uh, some, of the, some of the results we have got. So by upgrading the backup pipeline, we were able to reduce the end-to-end um, -end backup time by, by half and we obtained like up to two orders of magnitude compression by use of uh, deduplication. And these two mechanisms combined uh, led to significantly reduced infra cost and lower uh, operational overhead. And I think that's our talk, thanks.
没有问题的话，我们就休息一会儿。我们三点钟开始下一个